Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again, Mishmash Monday. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, we got a few things to get to today. A couple projects should be fun. Uh, also, we just had a little bit of a thunder shower here today. So the humidity creeps back after the quick thunder shower. Um, it's been warm. I was telling you this warm and humid here the, the whole week. Nothing record breaking, although they're trying to make it seem like it's record breaking. 90 degrees. That's for New York. That's nothing. However, the other day I go up upstairs, I put my kitchen light on and I notice it's dim, dimmer than, than I like to you know notice. And you know what I am? I'm big on knowing the current that comes into my house. So what do I say? Uh-oh, dim light. I quick get out my voltage reader and uh, check the voltage. And sure enough, I'm down at 101 volts. Now, uh, that's very low. I mean, for us, we're supposed to have minimum of 115. Usually it's between the, the absolute lowest you're supposed to go here is 110. But that we haven't had 110 voltages here in a long time. It's usually between 115 and 120. That's when your appliances will work most efficiently. And uh, if you have appliances that are meant to run on 115 and you don't give it that much voltage, they run hotter, which means your refrigerators or your air conditioners, it's bad enough they're running longer because uh, of the, the weather, but now you're putting even more taxation on. That's when they run hot and that's when they fail. So I called up Con Edison and I said, hey, listen, yeah, I got low voltage here in my house. And they're like, oh, really? They were acting all surprised, right? So as soon as they were acting surprised, I said, something's up. So uh, the lady's like, okay, well, you know, we'll send the crew down to you. Did you do something with your electrical? You know, like it's my fault. I was like, yeah, I'm grounding out my, my lines. I got them. I'm running all kinds. Of course not. Uh, you, nothing's changed here. It's it's something you're doing. And she's like, okay, you know, we'll send somebody and be within 24 hours. So I'm supposed to wait by the door for 20 That ain't happening. So I go on the we Con Ed website and what do I see? Look at this. They're dropping voltages in certain northern Queens areas, mine, by 8%. Come on now. And you know something now? This is This is why you have to document it. Because uh, if you do, if an appliance does go out during that time, you you can go to small claims court and take them to small claims court because they're not supplying you with the voltage that uh, you agreed upon. Anyway, it's a, it's just a pain. So it's back to normal now. But the squeaky hinge gets the oil. Remember that. You always got to, as soon as you notice something, take a voltage reading and call up your electrical company and say, hey, I'm not playing this game with you. And they're like, okay, and then they up the voltage. Anyway, we got a few things to get to. Let's get started right away. Now, last week, I was showing you that uh, Squire padlock that I that I had that I enjoyed. And I, I was putting it away, and I have other lever locks that I was putting it next to. And I want to show you this one. This is one's quite a bit larger. This is a big one. Now, these are considered like decoration locks. They're made in sometimes uh, areas like Pakistan, India, things like that. But don't let that fool you. These are still uh, strong, heavy, solid steel locks. And, um, you know, they're hard to... You, picking them is, is much harder, especially with this one's got the pin here and the hollow tip key. You see here that goes over like this. You turn it and uh, very smooth, opens up. And again, they're based off of that design, that 100-year-old design. I just wanted to clean this up because I was looking up there. I was getting some rust on there. I, I bought it like this. I didn't uh, do anything to it before, but I said now's about the time. And uh, I find it really, like I said, interesting. But what I'm going to do, uh, one thing I did notice is see when you go to close it, it's it's not, I got to straighten out the shock a little bit and you don't want to put any stress on the pin. So you have to hold it here when you bend this back. Because if you try and just bend it like this, you're just going to put you know, strain on the pin. You don't do that. And uh, then I wanted to clean it up, get all the rust off and see if I can't make it into, you know, something decent. So let's do, I might have to give it a, a vapor rust soak, but let's straighten out this, see if I can't get this working straight before I put it into any evapor rust. See how that goes and it's hitting. Now, all we have to do is put this into the vise, use a uh, Richie Kemp's a monster wrench and we'll just bend it back. Okay. 
about three minutes on the vise, and you can see now, watch how this closes. You see it's closing, it's spaced now evenly in between there. That's just what we wanted, okay? Now we don't want that bent. And we didn't put any stress on the pin. We were holding it here. Very important. Uh, now, like I said, we're going to put this in Evaporust to try and start with some. And then we'll go over it and make this just a nice, smooth, kind of old-looking and fun lock to deal with. But uh, let's do that. Okay, this is 15 hours in the Evaporust. You can see it got rid of all the, the rust, especially inside the lock and stuff. But... Now what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, you know, go over the finish. We're going to wire brush it. That'll always bring up the sheen, and then we'll determine what we want to do as far as a finish on these. Okay, we're almost done with the lock. We wire brushed it and everything. We have it looking, looking nice, right? Look how we do the bottom here. It's 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 looking like a better quality lock, but again, you know, like lipstick on a pig. You don't want to go crazy. It's a pl primitive lock. I was contemplating flame bluing it. Uh, to give it that old, old look. And you can see how the keys come out. But right now, what we have to do, because this was in Evaporus and all that, we have to uh, really drench this lock with some WD-40. That'll get rid of the moisture and then put a lubricant in it and uh, try it from there. So there we go. This is uh, coming good so far. Okay, to do some flame bluing, first thing you need is a propane torch, a little bit of uh, motor oil to qu quench it. You don't have to. You could let that cool off on its own. And uh, and your your item that you want to flame blue. Now, um, when you're flame bluing, you want to stick to things that, like this here, is mild steel. You're not going to disrupt any temper. It's not hardened. You don't want to flame blue tools because uh, when you do hit it with the heat, it will change the temper. And it could change. It could screw up your tool. So you got to be very careful when you do it on a tool. But uh, on something like this, this is a perfect candidate for any kind of flame blowing. So what we're going to do is we're going to heat it up. You're going to have to hang it by something. I have a little bit of hanger here. We're going to hang it, heat up a little bit. When it's good, we're going to quench it in the oil and uh, see how that looks. Now, actually, this is a job best done outside because you're dipping it into oil. But uh, listen to the lock when it goes in the oil. I love that sound. Okay, we're calling this one done. I have to tell you something. When you're going to oil flame blue something this big it takes a lot of time to heat it up to get it to that blue you got to be patient but then all of a sudden you'll see it turn a straw color and then that purple blue and uh and there we go you know and then you can see how it looks it's it's uh and this is a very durable finish you know you can oil it you don't have to worry about it uh coming off um the other good thing is when you dip this in oil now the lock is super hot when you dip that in oil, all the oil gets into the insides and it makes it super smooth. Let me show you. Let me show you how nice this works now. There's the catch over there. You see it? Watch this. Watch. Just beautifully smooth. And uh, I, I love this lock. I love it because I've seen how these are made. And there's videos uh, all over YouTube of uh, Pakistan and India where they make locks like this. And it's just amazing to me how these guys do it by hand, you know, and uh, it's it's so much handwork involved in this thing. Uh, hours and uh, really interesting. And I'll put a link in the video to how this lock or locks like this are made. And uh, I think you'd be interested. Okay, next up, uh, we got a few punches that we got at Zagray, and I got to tell you something. These can be a lot of fun if you take your time and you really do them up nice. This one's a Craftsman, unknown on this one. I don't know what this one is either, but this one here, number two, I bet you'll be surprised at who made that one. So you could see, again, I bought this in a bucket of tools. I paid $10 for the bucket, but these are nice punches. Let's get them back to looking nice. Okay, this is about 15 hours in the evaporush. You can see what it did here. Got rid of all this, most of the surface rust that has it coming down. But now we have to work on it. We're going to take a lot of this to the belt sander anyway. But uh, the wire brush, things like that for the knurling. We'll get to that. And now. here's our post wire brush evaluation on the punches. You can see looks very good. Now all we have to do, that's one of the problems with round punches. They always roll off. That's why punches are either octagon or square or something. Round punches will always roll off your table. Um, now what we're going to do is we got to address the tips. We got to address the back of that. It's important to keep your punches dressed up and, and right. And we'll hit it with the belts and to really make these look good. 
Okay, first up, we are going to touch up these punches, but uh, you see that tip? Whoever ground this here was all over the place with it. We can do better. It is sharp, and I'm sure it will work, but, you know, it, it's not really attractive, and all them facets won't make for any strength. And uh, if, you, if you have the time, I like to do it on the belt sand. It keeps the tip a little bit cooler, but you can do it on the grinder. You just got to dip it. You want to keep this very cool. Now, this was a pleasant surprise to find in that bucket, especially since snap-on punches are so expensive. The only issue that I have is um, because it is a snap-on, I can't take it down deep or I'll lose the name. So my hands are tied. I got to come up with a way to make this punch look good without ruining it. Now, you know my favorite part. Remember what these punches look like before we started. And we're calling this project done. What do you think about this, huh? I got to tell you something, I spent a lot of time on here, but this is all practice. Everything you do in the shop is practice. Let's take a look here. First of all, remember what the tip looked like. Remember that? Look at that tip now. Isn't that a beautiful tip? That's a proud, <laughs> you should be proud of that tip. And it's very sharp. So that came out good. Then this one here, the surprise one, a snap-on. This is the first snap-on punch I have. See that snap-on? And the reason we had to blue it is because, like I said, you know, to keep, in order to keep the lettering, I couldn't go too deep. So that gives you a presentable chisel or punch without seeing the pits, the blue bluing. And then I blued here, left the, the two ends non-blued. I think that looks really sweet, doesn't it? So there we go. We got our snap on. Then we got the craftsman. Now this one was all mushroomed in the back. And look what I did in the back here. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that curved on all edges, top. That's just a nice punch now. And this is a good size. I use this quite a bit this size. It's thick enough that it won't bend like these other ones do. But um, it does come in handy a lot. And I was able to keep most of the lettering. And uh, there we go. And the bevels. Remember the bevels? It takes a long time, but you got to do those bevels. And it's super soft and nice in the hand. And then last up, we have this one. This one was a rusted hunk of junk. There was a number on here. But uh, no name, and uh, it's a professional. It's not a handmade, which I thought it might have been. But it is a beautiful, uh, long punch now. So there we go. These are in the cam. What do you think of these punches? Okay, uh, you, as you know, any shop time is fun time. So uh, it was a lot of fun today. Got a, a few things done. Also, uh, I had to go shopping today. Um, and when I did... There was a beautiful rainbow. It just finished a thunder shower. I'm always looking for rainbows. And, uh, oh, what a beautiful rainbow. And, you know, I looked around and I said, here's one of the most beautiful sights you'll ever see, right? And people were just oblivious to it. And when I was a kid, if there was a rainbow, people would be pointing, saying, oh, check it out, rainbow, rainbow. It was like such a big deal. Today, I don't know what it is. People are just, you know, oblivious and could care less, nonchalant. Eh, so what? Rainbow. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. My favorite rainbow, I still remember the best rainbow I ever saw was in Mexico. I was in Mexico, I think it was Tijuana. And uh, boy, I saw the most beautiful, vivid rainbow I ever saw in my life. I'll never forget that till the day I die. You ever see a rainbow? You ever see a double rainbow? I have one on the video. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you have a great day. We'll see you again on Wednesday. Take care now. Bye-bye.